Hello, I am Harvey Ambrose, and I am preaching this message on behalf of the Missionary Baptist Voice of Africa radio program that is broadcast out of our station in Monrovia, Liberia. Uh, we are continuing in the study of Exodus chapter 4, uh, and we are going to begin our reading uh, in verse 18. Exodus chapter 4. Verse 18. And Moses went and returned to Jethro his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren, which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men that are for all the men are dead which sought thy life. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, thy firstborn. And I'll uh, stop the reading there and try to talk about this. We may be able to finish the chapter, but we'll see. So, in Exodus 3, we have the story of how Moses turned aside to see a bush that burned with fire, uh, but was not consumed. And when he went there, he discovered that it was the Lord that appeared to him in the bush, and he was holy. And he, his very presence sanctified the dirt that Moses had stepped onto and he had to remove his shoes. And he had to turn away from God for fear of God and for fear of seeing his face. And he figured he would die if he did. He might have been right. And how the Lord called Moses at that time to go into Egypt and to deliver from bondage uh, the children of Jacob, or Israel, the children of Israel, whom by this time the Egyptians had, had made to be slaves. They were not always slaves down there. For a time they were highly regarded because they were the family of uh, Joseph who had saved Egypt and brought it great prosperity when all other nations were in deep trouble. But... Uh, Eventually, that generation died off, and the Pharaoh that was of that generation, and someone else came, and, and they made slaves of them. Nevertheless, the Lord had prospered them and caused them to multiply exceedingly, and, and they were well fed and all that. But this other Pharaoh had, had begun to enslave them and, uh, and made their life hard and cruel, and they had begun to call out to God, and God had sent someone to deliver them. And this is a picture. Moses is. He's a real person. And these things really happen physically in this world. But it's a type, a picture, a representation of Jesus who came from God into this world so as to do what was necessary to deliver his people from bondage. And the bondage that we're under is a bondage unto sin. For we are, we are, uh, uh, I think, I can't remember the word for it. I think it's called a house-born slave. We are, we were born into a slavery to sin because we inherited through our fathers a sin nature. And we are, we are bound, we are, we are prone or bent towards sin from before we even come from the womb. It is our nature to do it because we are born of a corrupt race. Adam having sinned, uh, he brought sin into the world and death by sin and it falls upon all men and, 
And so we're under that bondage. And, and our Pharaoh is Satan. And Jesus came to pay a blood price. He's the, the firstborn of God. You know, the firstborn through the resurrection. He is God's only begotten son who paid a price in his own blood. His, the deliverance he wrought was a deliverance not of, of punishing others to deliver people, but allowing himself to be punished. All the wrath that God had uh, justly set aside for us and ordained for us, he paid that price in his own body so that we could be set free. And you all know this, but it's helpful, I think, as we go through a study of this, that we understand that it's not just a story, because since it's a type of, of ourselves, it relates to us. And the Lord is pretty good in making sure that the typology is close enough where we can learn lessons from the physical type so that in our hearts we begin to, with the help of the Spirit of God, to understand the spiritual significance of these things. Well, in chapter 4, I mean, chapter 3, we heard how God called Moses to deliver Israel. In chapter 4, the first half of it, we learn how uh, Moses does not want to. In fact, he objects to it, and he brings all types of objections to God. He, he has questions, and then he, he makes remarks about his, his inability. His, uh, he's just not, he's not capable of this, and, and who is he that he can do something like this? And, and the Lord answers him at every turn, and eventually... Moses submits to the call, as all of God's servants must do, or they could not serve him. So he has a call from God, a particular call to do a particular thing, and despite his unworthiness, both as he sees it and in reality, his incapacity, there's no way that he as a man, absent the power of God, could do this thing, or even begin to do it. Pharaoh wouldn't hear him at all. But God did. And he went down there to do it with the power of God. It's interesting in our uh, in our uh, reading here tonight, it says, Moses took the rod of God in his hand. That's interesting because it was, a, in a sense, the rod was God's because it was all things are God's. He owns all that there is. He owns all the gold and all the silver and, and all the hills and all the cattle on the hills and, and all the planets. And then he, he owns it all. Everything is God's. But it was Moses' rod in the first place. I mean, it was God's in so much that he gave it, but Moses was using it when he went to the bush. And the Lord asked him, well, what is it that you've got in your hand? And he said, well, it's a rod. And so then God said, well, cast it on the ground. It became a snake. This is one of the signs that God used to convince Moses that, uh, that he was going to be going to Egypt with the power of God to work miracles sent from God so that Egypt would eventually, uh, Pharaoh would eventually uh, relent and submit to God. But not immediately, but eventually he would submit to God even though it's going to cost him his firstborn son because of the hardness of his heart. But it was, it was Moses' rod. But here we call, it says in the text, Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but that struck me as I tried to study some for this. And it said, because God had put honor upon the rod by you know, in the hand of Moses and him casting it on the ground and, and God changing it to a serpent and then, then telling Moses to grab it by the tail and he grabs it and it becomes a rod again. Uh, God had honored the rod such that it was now no longer Moses' rod but the rod of God. And in a sense, God had honored Moses because he called him to a task and, and, and Moses submitted to the task and God is going to place upon Moses the power 
to execute the task that has been assigned to him, and he will do it. He will succeed. <coughs> Excuse me. Moses will succeed in doing exactly and everything that God tells him to do. And therefore he's become the man of God. So the rod of God, which was just a rod, but God put his honor on it and it became the rod of God. Men whom God calls to a task and God through his power gives the men the ability to do what he has assigned them to do. He sets his honor upon the men. And throughout the Bible, such men are called men of God. The rod became the rod of God. A man who was not the man of God becomes the man of God. And I don't know if any of you listened to uh, what I tried to preach years ago, uh, the Gospel according to John, I guess perhaps my favorite book in the world. But uh, in the Gospel according to John, Jesus asked a question, uh, which is applicable to you. And, uh, and it's, it's got to do with honor from God. Just as the, a piece of wood was honored by God because God invested it with power and Moses became the man of God and is referred to as that many times in the Bible because he submitted to God and, and God worked wonders through him. Did you know that you can be honored and receive honor from God and become a man of God if you submit to God? Now, some people think that submitting to God is, is by, and believe me, I have no problem in people studying the scriptures. We should study the scriptures to show ourselves approved unto God. <clears throat> but first we have to submit ourselves to God. Now, in Jesus' time, the, uh, the Jewish rulers, the Pharisees and the chief priests and the scribes, they, uh, they didn't understand God. They, they knew the scriptures, but they didn't understand them rightly. They thought they did, but they understood only the letter and that not very well, but they knew nothing of the spirit of God. So, in chapter 5 of John, verse 39, Jesus tells these people, he says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me, and you won't come to me that you might have life. Saying that life is in Christ. And I know we're supposed to be talking about Moses, but Moses is a type of Christ. Just as Moses submitted himself to God, the Word of God submitted himself to the will of God and became the Son of God in the flesh and lived among us and we beheld his glory as John writes in his gospel. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. So the Son has come in and he's telling people that if you don't come to me, you won't have life. And the reason you don't have life is because you haven't come to me. Now think about that. But while you think about that, I'll read a little bit more. He starts talking about honor. Just like he had honored the rod and honored the Moses and, and turned the rod from a simple rod to the rod of God and turned a simple man Moses, maybe not so simple, but still just a man, into the man of God by the honor that he placed upon him. He says, after he says, and you have not come to me that you might have life. He says, I received not honor from men, but I know you, that you don't have the love of God in you. Which, by the way, that is the test. You know, people, uh, people wonder, how do I know that I'm saved? Well, I mean, God revealed it to me and he, and he spoke to my heart. He let me know that he had saved me. But, but it's, there, how, do I, how do I know that was true? Because something happened within me that, that in that instant changed and has never ceased to be. I went from a person that did not love God to someone who does love God. 
in a moment of time, when he forgave my sins and gave me peace in my heart, I loved him. I still love him. I love thinking about him. I love preaching about him. I'm not good at it, but I love it because I get to talk about him. I get to study him. I get to tell you about him. And it seems as though that never could bear fruit, but sometimes it does. Just hearing a simple word. That's all I ever heard before I began to seek the honor that comes from God. But he says, to these people, he says, you don't have the love of God in you. God knows whether or not you love him. Now, love is it's not just believing that he's God or believing that he's good, but it's genuine love. Just like you might love your wife or love your child or love your parents. If you really love someone, you, you can't explain why you just know that you do. I love God. I'm taking no credit for me, he, uh, for myself. He, he gave me the love. But you need to ask yourself, if you think you're saved, do you love God with all your heart? That's a good question. He continues, I came in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. But others will come in their own name, and then you'll receive. Jesus didn't come pressing any agenda other than repentance towards God. And that's what I try to preach because that's what he preached and that's what John the Baptist preached and that's what people need to hear. You have to turn away from the world, turn away from your own self, deny yourself and seek that other world. There is another world and, and it's a world that, that endures forever in a place where God is with us and his mercy endures forever and, and it's a forever place. And this place is so temporary. It seems like it's ancient, and people tell us it's way more ancient than it is, but, but it's, a few, it's several thousands of years old, and, and that's ancient to little short-lived people like us. But uh, there's another world that'll never end. And he says, uh, I came in my Father's name. I just came telling you about my Father so that you could be saved and but you don't receive it. But you receive other people. Any other man that's got a PhD behind his name or, or, or teaches at some university or, or is you know a, a president or a king, or so you're going to listen to them. But you won't listen to Jesus, who is king of kings and lord of lords, whose father is, is the lord of heaven and earth, according to Christ. Then he asked this question. How can you believe? That's, that's a question to you as well. How can you believe? And by that he means, he means wholeheartedly trust because he's talking about salvation and eternal life that comes. So he says, and since it comes through trusting God, once you've repented, you, you have to trust that he will do these things for you. Trust him completely, which you can only do through his help. But he won't help you if you don't seek it, if you don't pray for it. How can you believe? And you might as well say, how can you be saved which receive honor one from another? In other words, you're satisfied with what some person tells you about whether or not you're saved. You're satisfied by what some priest said or, 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 or some preacher said or, or someone who baptized you said or, or someone that got you to repeat a sinner's prayer said or, or who knows, it's a million things that men will tell you to say, that's good enough. You got it. You've done it. How can you believe which receive honor, that type of lip service, one from another, and never seek the honor which comes from God alone. Now let that sink in. The honor of God turned the stick into the stick of, into the rod of God. The honor from God upon Moses turned him into the man of God. An honor that comes from God, giving you eternal life, will turn you into a child of God. And, and he might refer to you as a man of God someday. I don't know, but you'll become God's child. And there is no greater honor than to be born, and in this case, born from above, born a second time, 
You're born naturally at first, but you need to be born into the household of God. And you can be. It is, it is absolutely free. All it requires is your entire heart. It doesn't require your money. It doesn't require your diligence. It, well, it takes some diligence, but I mean, it doesn't require uh, your pursuit and, and accomplishment of a bunch of good works. It requires your heart. You have to submit your heart to God and, and seek after Him in prayer until He honors you with the gift of everlasting life and let you know it. I need to get back on track or I'll never finish. So anyway, now in our text, uh, Moses goes back to his father-in-law's home. He's been on the backside of the desert when, when God called him up there on the mountain of God, which is called Horeb and it's called Sinai and it's called Hagar. It's got different names depending upon the language that's being used at the time. But there's only one of them. And so Moses was there when he got called and when he responded to God and submitted. Now he goes back to the man whose sheep he had been tending, Jethro, his father-in-law. Because even though he's been called to do a great thing, and it is a great thing that he does and that God enables him to do, way greater than, than really anything else Moses ever has done or ever shall do. This is the defining thing of Moses' life. It is what makes him more famous than anybody on earth except for our Lord Jesus Christ. Still famous after, after 3,500 years having passed. Moses. Everybody knows the story. But still, being honored by God like that does not, does not cause us to have no obligations to the world of men. Jethro was his father-in-law. He had been kind enough to take Moses in when he was a fugitive. He was kind enough to, to let him marry his daughter and to raise up grandsons to Jethro. He was the priest of Midian. And, and Moses could have just said, hey, I'm going to go. You know, I mean, I'm, God's called me and I don't need to talk to Jethro. I've got, you know, see, that's the wrong kind of thinking. And Moses doesn't think that way. He was meek. And he was, and he was decent. If we're called of God to serve God, it should make us, if anything, more honorable in our behavior towards men than we were in the past. We treat men better. Having been treated by God so well, we are inclined to treat men well, to think more highly of them than we did in the past and to, and to be better towards our fellow man than we were before we met God. So he goes back to Jethro. And he doesn't say, you've got to let me go. He says, let me go, I pray thee. He's, he's asking, he's begging, if you will. He's asking permission from Jethro to return back to Egypt where his family is, my brethren, he calls them, meaning the children of Israel. And see whether they be yet alive. See, he, it seems as though he's not kept tabs on what's going on in Egypt since he's left. And I think that's important for us to know. It's like, you know, in the Bible, there's one place where it says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Well, Moses had determined to leave behind the pleasures of Egypt and all the power that he could have had as the prince of Egypt and already had enjoyed as the prince of Egypt, but he had forsaken all that for a wilderness to be closer to God and further from the pleasures of sin. So he had, I think, intentionally just wanted to hear nothing of Egypt. But now he's saying, I wonder if they're still alive. You know, now God had told him that Aaron was going to come and that he was going to use Aaron. So I guess he wants to see him. Anyway, that's, that's the words he chose to say to Midian. I mean, to Jethro, the priest of Midian. And Jethro says, go in peace. He has permission. And then God... Kind of, I guess, start speaking to uh, to him again. Let me see if I can find where we are now. Um, and so God further instructs Moses. Mo uh, Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father said, let me go. It's a, in verse 19, the Lord said unto Moses in Midian. So now God had told him generally what he had to do, but he didn't say start. 
Well, now he says start. He got back to Midian. He got permission from Jethro. Apparently God approved of that. And now he says, go, return into Egypt. And he tells them a little bit more. He says, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. Now, God, Moses never said anything about being afraid of the people back in Egypt, but he did flee for fear of his life. And maybe there was a nagging doubt or fear in Moses' heart. Now, see, God knows what's in man. He knows if you're afraid of something. He knows if you're proud. He knows if, if your thoughts are evil. He, he knows everything that's in you. He knew what was in Moses. Apparently, or at least there's a good chance, Moses was afraid that if he went to Egypt, he'd be killed because he had slain an Egyptian 40 years before. But he says, don't worry about that. Everyone that sought your life over what you did, they're all dead. Now, I had said, I think maybe last week I ill-advisedly, while I was trying to preach, said something about, uh, you know, that maybe it was the same Pharaoh that was in charge when Moses left 40 years ago. But that's not correct, because that Pharaoh sought Moses' life, and he's dead now, according to God. So I misspoke there. It's been a while since I've studied Exodus like I should. So the, the Pharaoh that sought to kill Moses because Moses killed the Egyptian, and all other people in Egypt that had sought to kill Moses, now they're the ones that are dead, and Moses is alive. And God says, it's time to go. So go. Well, now he didn't say, take your wife and kids. But Moses did. It says, Moses took his wife and sons. And he put them upon an ass. Sounds like a single donkey as opposed to three of them. So I think the sons are very young. You know, donkeys aren't too big. So he puts them all on an ass, it says. And he returned to the land of Egypt. Or he started to anyway. And he took the rod of God in his hand. Now, it's kind of significant that I think the sons are young because, you know, everybody that was uh, over the age of 20 except for uh, Joshua and Caleb in the wilderness, which is a coming up thing, they all died in the wilderness, according to the Bible. I don't know if that pertains to Moses' immediate family because they weren't delivered from slavery like the rest of them. I'm not sure. But uh, in any case, I think they were young. They were going to be much younger than 20. So it didn't apply to them. Although it might have applied to Moses' wife. I don't know. But he took his wife and his sons. He put them on an ass. And, uh, and he, he begins to return to Egypt. He took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord continues to instruct him. So it's, now, now it's, not, it's not profound. It's not like it was at the burning bush when he was first... Uh, called to the task of delivering uh, the nation of Israel from slavery. You know, it seems like when, when we get saved, at least in my case, when I got saved, it was a very profound event. I was so unbelieving and hard-hearted that it, it just, it took a miracle to convince me that God had saved me. But when he convinced me, I was convinced. When he called me to preach, I was very hard to convince. But when he convinced me, I had to do it. But after that, after those kind of shocking events where it takes a lot of convincing because, well, in the one case it was too good to be true. In the other case, it was too hard to believe. Uh, then it's, he speaks more softly to us. He, he instructs our hearts, not so much with words or with powerful uh, displays of, of his will, but just regularly as needed to instruct us. He had told Moses, I'm going to teach you what to say when he was up on the mountain. Well, now he's teaching him what to say. The Lord said unto Moses, when thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. Which, what that means is, whether it's the rod or, or whether it's, it's not a magic rod, but I'd say it's a holy rod if it's the rod of God. God has so touched that rod. I mean, see, I think it's that rod that he stretches out over the Red Sea and, and the Red Sea parts. I mean, it's God has bestowed great honor upon that stick, probably above all other sticks that there, 
<laughs> that have ever been or ever will be, except maybe the cross upon which Jesus died. But, uh, but it's truly the power of God and not the power of the rod. But in any case, he says, there's going to be a lot of things that I'm going to have you do. A lot of miracles, wonders. What they are is plagues. For the most part, they're punishments because of the refusal of Pharaoh to let people go, to send them out. And he says, so you make sure that you do everything that I tell you to do when you get down to Egypt. So he's, he's traveling to Egypt. God is telling his heart what's going to be happening, what he needs to make sure he does. He says, uh, but I will harden. See, he's talking about Pharaoh. Wonders before Pharaoh. He says, but I will harden. And you might translate it strengthen. In other words, give, give him more courage in the heart that he normally would have. I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. So he's telling Moses in advance so that Moses is not surprised by Pharaoh's behavior when it happens. He says, I want you to do what I tell you to do. I'm going to have you work lots of miracles. You do exactly what I tell you and so that, Mo, so that Pharaoh will let the people go. But he won't let them go because I'm going to harden his heart. Now, Pharaoh had already hardened his own heart to the cries of the slaves that he kept in bondage or to the groans of them under their burdens or the cries of the mothers after he killed their children. I mean, he, he had already hardened his heart against his fellow man whom he treated with utter contempt and hatred, I guess. I don't know why uh, people can feel that, that they have a right to, to take other people's lives and, 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 to, and to treat them horribly. Who, who made them someone that has a right to be cruel and evil? To, and I'm telling you, you have no right to do that either, nor have I. Maybe some of you do. I have no idea who listens to this radio station, but nobody has been given the right to be cruel and, and evil in their treatment of their fellow man. He tells us that we should uh, do unto others as we would have others do unto us. Treat others the way we want them to treat us. Not the way they do treat us, which may be worse, but the way we want them to. In other words, we've got to be really good to our neighbors. In fact, he says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. This is the first and greatest commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. Upon these two commandments, Jesus says, hangs the entire law. Because if you can love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself, you won't sin against either one of them. And that covers all the, the, the Ten Commandments and everything that's in the law. It covers it all. Love, it says, covers a multitude of sins. Pharaoh was wrong to treat these people like this, and God was going to let him know it, but he had already hardened his heart as a man, or he would not have he would have heard the cries of the people, and he would have had compassion on them rather than than tyranny. But because he hardened his heart towards God's people, God further hardened his heart so that when he brings terrible plagues one after the other upon the land of Egypt and upon Pharaoh himself personally, he still won't let them go. Whereas had God not hardened his heart, he would have just out of fear and, and just out of common sense said, okay, it is not worth having my whole land invaded by frogs or locusts or hail or, or darkness. This is just too much. All the cattle are dead. Everybody's dead. I mean, you know, it finally took the death of his first, his oldest son to finally make him let him go. And even then he changed his mind and it cost him his own life when he drowned in the Red Sea. Of course, I'm jumping ahead. So because Pharaoh was a hard-hearted man, God hardens his heart further so that he is thoroughly punished for his sins before he finally lets those people go. 
he would otherwise had relented earlier. But he wanted God wanted to show his power against hard-hearted people. And what's going to happen to you? See, the, I just changed that to you, didn't I? I did it, it just how it came out of my mouth. But that's how it is because this is a picture of a bigger reality. If you are hard-hearted against God and against your fellow man to start with, that's how we start, thinking more of ourselves than others, thinking too much of ourselves and too little of others and, and, and having a hard heart towards God. If you don't change, God's going to punish you. In fact, he may, he may harden your heart. If you look at, uh, just like he did Pharaoh's, to where you just, you just become foolish. In Romans chapter 1, he, we read about such people as this. It says uh, people who, who don't, it says they don't want to, uh, they want, don't want to retain a knowledge of God in themselves. Uh, it says uh, in verse 21 of Romans 1, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncomfortable God into an image of a, like unto a corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creepy things, meaning false idols, Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. So he starts talking about all the moral sins, okay, and, and vile affections, men and men, women and women, that kind of stuff, sexually. And it says, uh, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they don't even want to think about him. That's today. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, all that stuff. Okay. But we go to chapter 2 in Romans, and it says this. It says, uh, thou art, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges for... Well, let me drop down. It says... Uh, uh, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things, the things I've just talked about. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them and, and do such things and does the same thing, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. So in other words, what happens is, and no doubt happened to Pharaoh, you know, after every plague and, and every punishment on the land of Egypt, you know, Pharaoh would say, okay, stop it. And, and God stopped it. And then he hardened his heart and he had to bring another plague. See, when we sin and God is forbearing, towards us. He doesn't punish us immediately. And then we think, well, we got away with that. We didn't die. He didn't take our life from us. He won't do it the next time. So I'm going to go sin again. And, and, and you may have some consequence from that sin. You may be afraid that God's going to take your life. And, and he doesn't. And you say, oh, well, maybe there is no God because well, nothing's happened to me, and I'm, and I'm violating every commandment in the book. This is exactly the way that God hardens hearts. It's not he's actively hardening your heart, but because he is forbearing, meaning he's patient with you, he's good to you, he continues to feed you and clothe you and, and give you air to breathe and, and, and causes your body to function like, like it should because he upholds all things that says by the word of his power. That's even your own life. He says he holds your breath in his hand. He's allowed you to keep breathing and to keep eating and to keep being sheltered and, and your life continues and you think, there's no God because I do all kinds of wicked stuff and I'm still alive. He says, you're despising the riches of his goodness and his forbearance and his long suffering, his patience towards you. But don't you know, it says that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. He's, he's wanting you to repent. 
But it says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, you treasure up unto thyself wrath. See, all this putting off is like, well, I'm, I'm not going to repent because I don't think there's a God. He doesn't ever punish you. He says he's going to punish me. He's never punished me. Well, see, he's just being patient with you. But he's, he, he's writing it all down. All the good things he's done for you and how you have never done what he has told you to. You've never repented. You've never trusted. You've never, you've never sought him out. In fact, you've never sought the honor that comes from God only, which is the gift of immortality and life through Christ Jesus. You never sought that. You, you sought worldly things. And he hasn't punished you, so you think it's okay, but no, no, he's, it's all been written out in a book. Now, he's, he's wanting you to repent. So he's saving your life. And he, and he stops you from dying. And he doesn't take your life. But ultimately, if like Pharaoh... You never repent. You die in your sins. And then there is certainly a price to be paid. He says, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, you are treasuring up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, they get eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they get indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. But glory, honor, peace to every man that worketh good. Because God's no respecter of persons. So do what's right and not wrong. Pharaoh chose the wrong. And most people in this world choose the wrong. Broad is the road that leads to death, according to an old song. <clears throat> And thousands walk together there. I should say millions, probably billions walk together there. It says, the old song says, but wisdom shows a narrow path with here and there a traveler. You need to be on the narrow road and not the broad road that leads to death. So it says, uh, so he tells them he's not going to let them go he reminds Pharaoh, he says, Israel is my firstborn son. I'll mention that just a moment. So that because of the, God's love of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's made promises to them. And through them, Christ is going to come to the world. And, and all those promises will be fulfilled. But, and, and they have been fulfilled in Christ. But, uh, but when it comes to Israel in the flesh, it is a special case because just like he put honor upon that rod of Moses and he put honor upon Moses himself, he put honor upon the physical descendants of Israel. That doesn't mean they were all saved, but as a physical nation, he honored them. He called them his firstborn. Unlike many people who teach that every single Jew is going to be saved, I would say that all Israel will be saved, but Israel is not a physical nation. It's a spiritual nation. It's, it's a, it is a nation comprised, the Israel that is above, the Bible teaches us, is a nation that is comprised of those who have been born again in whom the Spirit of God has given new life. We are the Israel of God. We are the descendants of Abraham. Spiritually, the, and many of his, spirit, his physical descendants are also spiritual descendants. But, uh, but on that physical nation, he bestowed honor upon it as a nation uh, just because. Because they were the descendants of the men that he loved, like Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, others, King David. 
But ultimately, because of their hardness and their impenitent hearts, he, uh, he destroyed them. And he took away their place. And he took away their temple. And he took away their city. And he scattered them all over the world. Let's not let that happen to us. God bless you. Goodbye.